Hi, in this video we have got some more PCBs from JLC PCB to continue the power supply project for the Fieldtech FY6900 signal generator. So in the last video you saw me assemble the DC to DC converter board and we could just screw this into the casework and have a 24 volt jack on the back of the unit and we would be complete. However, I do want to have the AC input on the back considering that there's already an IEC connector and a fuse and a power switch. Uh, we may as well have everything internal to the device. So we've got this separate PCB which is designed to stack directly so you can see that the holes are in the same place. So we can stack these directly on top of each other with some PCB spacers and then this will allow us to take in our AC voltage from the house and put it down to 24 volts to input into this second PCB. So if we have a little look at the schematic you can see it's very simple. What we've got is our 230 volt input on the left here, although it will accept 115 volts as well. We've got a series fuse and a varistor to protect against surges and overcurrents. And we always put that after the fuse because if there is a event that causes this varistor to break down, then it will blow the fuse and protect everything on the PCB. If we had this the other side of the fuse, this could continue conducting if there was a continuous over voltage event and then it could eventually cause a fire. Then we've got our power brick here so this accepts AC input and just outputs 24 volts and we have this pin called adjust which if you connect it up to the preset here it allows you to tweak the voltage up and down around the nominal 24 volts. For this application we don't need to fit that because we don't need a particularly stable 24 volts. Uh, we can have anything from about 17 or 18 volts all the way up to 35 volts. Then on the right hand side we've got the LED a few capacitors and then our terminal block to our second PCB. You'll see we've also got this component here bridging between the ground AC ground and our zero volts output. I've nominally drawn it as a capacitor but this could be a resistor or even just a plain wire link and what we need to do when we build the PCB up is to test whether the output of this device is floating because what we don't want is similar to what we were seeing before where the outputs could be floating up at around 90 or 100 volts AC. Although extremely current limited, um, we want to be able to have this safely connected to any electronics on the output. So if we're seeing this floating up and it's not internally connected to AC ground, we can just bridge these two nodes here and then that problem will be sorted. So here's our AC to DC power module and you can see it's a Mornson 1.1 amp LH25-13B24 and this was from LCSC and it's quite a nice little module. We'll see how well it performs shortly but this is basically all self-contained and basically we can just put this into the PCB, hopefully the footprint's correct and you can see we need very little in terms of external components to get our 24 volts out to our second PCB. And we're just going to trim these leads first because if we soldered the leads on this power module first and then tried to cut them there's a high chance that we could cause some fractures in the solder because these are really quite thick legs. So I'm just going to trim these first. Right so next up we want to test that the board is working properly so I've just connected up a mains lead I've also just put some standoffs on the bottom so that the pins aren't pressing into the ESD mat. So we should be able to turn this on now at the isolation transformer. And I think you saw there probably that the green LED has turned on. Let's just check the output voltage. I'll just zoom out a little bit and bring in the Fluke 289. And yeah, so that's sitting at basically 24 volts, so that's absolutely fine. The other thing that we want to check is whether the output of this is isolated from the input or whether there are some EMC components in here that are causing it to float up near 100 volts or whether the output is directly tied to mains earth. So we'll set this up to AC and if we put it in one of these and into the mains earth yeah we can see this is floating at about 100 volts AC and it will probably be at minimal current. On the Fluke 289 we do have a low impedance AC measurement so we'll select that one and see if that makes any difference. And yeah it's dropped straight away. So it is very current limited but I think we do need this additional component in here 
just to tie this down to mains earth so that when we're connecting things up on our um, delicate electronics PCBs we haven't suddenly got something floating up near 100 volts and then uh, when we attach other probes we could fry the PCB. So uh, we're we'll just to put a uh, probably a, just a 10 ohm resistor in that um, little block just here and then we'll be good to assemble this into the signal generator. Right so I've now put that resistor in here and what we should be able to do when the fluke started up is just measure the voltage between AC mains earth and the output and you can see now it's dropped right down to zero. So that does have the disadvantage that now the signal generator itself, the outputs are tied to mains earth but things like your oscilloscope and everything like that already are so it's not a huge problem it just means that you can't have this sitting in circuit somewhere floating up away from zero volts if you've got any other equipment connected to it. So that's all fine we can now put this in the caseworks. Right so what I've just done is I've put in two 12 millimeter spacers with um, some nylon screws through it and that just brings us above the height of the power supply module so when these are going to be screwed together you can just about see we've got about a millimeter gap between the power supply module and the DC to DC board and the thermal vias are not blocked by the power supply module so everything is good there. Unfortunately I've made a little bit of an error when measuring out these holes so you can see when I put this in the unit we've got these two holes absolutely fine but here we're missing the bottom two and I think what I did is I measured to the edge of the hole and not to the center so that's not quite going to work. What I'll do is I'll still use the standard screws in these two holes and probably what I'll do is I'll apply a bit of glue uh, to hold the board in place. Possibly we could drill through although it's going to be a little bit difficult with this boss in place. We could try drilling through and then just using some screws all the way through the caseworks to the PCB. It's a bit of a shame really because this PCB is quite easy uh, you know we've got quite a bit of space around there so we weren't restricted by components I just clearly uh, made an error. I couldn't bring myself to glue the board in it seemed a little bit hacky and potentially a little bit permanent so what I ended up doing is drilling through the casework and putting a couple of nylon screws through. Now the board is completely rigid um, it's a little bit of a shame really that we've had to uh, make any amendments to the case but these bumpers and everything sit much lower than the screw heads so these aren't really going to cause a problem other than aesthetics. So what we need to do now is you'll see I've put the wires in for the 24 volt supply ready to go into the top PCB. Now we need to tidy up this IEC connector on the back panel, wire it into the three terminals for the main supply and then we can screw the top PCB in place. Right so that's the mains wiring all done and you can see I've added some ferrules at the end of the wires here. That's just to stop any stray strands of copper from the wires just accidentally shorting out on these terminals given that these are at mains potential. You'll see I've also added a 40mm fan to the case and that's going to blow out through the back just to provide some airflow through the unit. So the heatsink here which has some power op amps underneath it to drive the outputs can get quite warm when it's driving 50 ohm loads and also the regulators on the DC to DC board so these linear regulators up here as we saw in the last video do dissipate some heat into full load as well. So when this is sat at the top this is relatively close to that fan and that's done on purpose so that it was close to the fan and I've also got this little heat sink which I've had for absolutely ages and finally got a chance to use it because uh, it does actually fit across these two regulators absolutely perfectly and once that's sat in the case that also happens to uh, draw air in that general direction. So what we're going to do next is we're just going to screw this PCB in place and then I'll stick the heatsink down with some little um, thermal adhesive pads. That's the heatsink on and I've also connected up the fan with a Molex KK type connector and here you can see we've got the DC to DC board mounted on top of the AC to DC board and this is all really quite rigid. It uh, feels pretty bulky and uh, it doesn't feel like it's going to go anywhere. So it feels like quite a robust solution. I've just started wiring in the connector that provides the DC to the signal generator mainboard. And I think we're going to source one of these crimp housings and some of the crimp terminals because uh, this ribbon cable in particular is extremely thin. 
And also, they have actually sacrificed one of the zero volt lines. So we've got two five volt lines. It would have been two zero volt lines and then a plus and minus 13 and a half volts. But one of the lines they chopped because on the original switch mode power supply, uh, that went off to the earth connector on the main side. And so um, there's not a whole lot in terms of connectivity for the zero volt line. Now you can see this is the original switch mode power supply and it's significantly more compact than what we've now got in the device. So um, we have added quite a lot of bulk, but I didn't feel particularly safe leaving this switched on in the lab, especially when I'm not here. I tend to leave quite a bit of equipment turned on. I'm going to sort out a solution to uh, kill a lot of the equipment when I leave, so just like an emergency stop button that will turn off the bits of equipment that don't need to be on. But uh, this just wasn't really built very well and didn't really feel that safe. So I'm quite happy with this design. It feels a lot safer. And, uh, you know, we have added a lot of bulk, but I'm quite fine with that. Right, so let's try turning this on. And we've got fan spin. And we've got our green LEDs on. Let's just quickly check the voltage rails before we make the final connection. So we've got the Mustool MDS8207 again, which is performing quite well actually. I'm quite happy with this multimeter, it's quite nice. And there's our 24 volts coming in. And then we should have minus 13 and a half, plus 13 and a half, and then our 5 volt rail. Yeah, and that's all fine. So we should be able to make the final connection. Let's plug this in. We've got relay clicking. I have got some stuff on the front panel display, so I'll just tidy this up. In fact, I think we can put the cover on now um, and we can just check that it is working properly. Right, so a quick functional check seems to show that we're able to use the device as normal. So uh, all of the settings work properly. Let's just check that we can output the correct output voltage. So we've got it set to 10, and the Rygol's reading 10.2 volts peak to peak. Let's check we've got our full 24. And yeah, 24.6. So the Rygol's just very slightly off. It always is on the voltage readings. But um, that seems to be fine. So when we output a DC voltage of 0 volts into the oscilloscope, you can see that we've got a little bit of noise in the signal here. And if we turn on the measurement, you can see that's about 8 to 10 millivolts peak to peak noise. And then with the FFT enabled, you can see there's no particular frequency component. So if this was noise from our switch mode power supply, you'd definitely see that 200 to 250 kilohertz switch mode noise. It's not. It's completely random across the whole frequency band. So what this actually is, is the noise of the analog stage in the waveform generator. So that's all of our noise components, flicker noise, thermal noise, all that kind of thing, along with the noise generated by the op amps and any other transistors and that kind of thing in the analog path. So that's good to see we're not introducing any noise component from our power supply. This is just noise that's generated by the signal generator on its own. Right, so that's that mini project completed, and I'm quite happy with how it's turned out. So it basically looks as it did from the factory. Unfortunately, just got the two screws on the bottom here, and we've also added the fan just to provide a little bit of cooling. I know on the forums, a few people mentioned that the unit runs quite hot when driving a 50 ohm load, so this should just help extend the life of the components inside, as well as keeping the linear regulators a little bit cooler. So it's probably slightly over-engineered compared to what we could implement, but uh, either way, it's an improvement over the standard power supply that came inside it, which I wasn't very happy with at all. There probably are some other DC to DC modules that you can buy to put in here. So I had a little look on eBay. I did find some that looked like they might do the job, but they are on the very cheap end and you don't really know whether you're getting quality components on those boards. So what we've got on here should last a good long while. And the bill of materials cost wasn't particularly excessive. They're all easy to get hold of parts, so the LM337, LM317, obviously those are run-of-the-mill uh, adjustable voltage regulators. Then we've got the 
TI simple switcher chips which are easily available and if you're a student or some, that kind of thing you can also get samples usually from the TI website. And then everything else on there is just bog standard parts, so standard capacitors, resistors, that kind of thing. So nothing too expensive. In fact, even the AC to DC converter module was not particularly expensive. It's a nice self-contained module. I think it cost about $17 from LCSC. And again, there's probably some cheaper modules that you can use, but I wanted this to be safe uh, in the lab, so I don't mind spending a little bit more on that kind of thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the design files on the website. So if you click on the link up here, that will take you to the page where there's the bill of materials as well as the Gerber files for both PCBs. And again, thank you to JLC PCB for providing those PCBs for this project. I hope you found the video useful and if you've got any comments, please leave them down below. But until next time, thanks for watching.